people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Pratiksha Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India's electronics market is rapidly expanding, driven by rising demand, Make in India initiatives and increased foreign investments. The country is focused on developing an indigenous semiconductor ecosystem with initiatives like the National Electronics Policy and a $10 billion PLI scheme boosting chip making efforts. India's semiconductor and electronic sector is experiencing significant growth fueled by government policies aimed at enhancing domestic manufacturing and reducing imports. The semiconductor market valued at $19 billion in 2023 is projected to reach $30 billion by 2025 marking a 58% increase. At Semicon India 2024, Prime Minister Narin Modi reaffirmed the country's commitment to expanding its semiconductor infrastructure, highlighting that India contributes 20% of the world's talent in the industry. He outlined plans to develop a workforce of 85,000 skilled professionals, including technicians, engineers and R&D experts in the coming years. The event attracted over 100 global CEOs, industry leaders and experts underscoring India's rising prominence in the global chip sector. In the 21st century, ke Bharat mein, the chips are never down. And it's not only so much. Today's Bharat दुनिया को भरोसा देता है when the chips are down you can bet on india the government's focus on expanding the semiconductor industry is set to invigorate related sectors and significantly increase job opportunities this push will enhance the semiconductor ecosystem and stimulate growth in allied industries creating a broader impact on employment and economic development. We can see uh, lots of potential because and not in terms of uh, manufacturing, the employment, real employment will generate from the UP so that all the candidates, all the youth who are doing pursuing their B.Tech or uh, Masters in the science, they can come and see the real, uh, we can say the real, what the, how the chip process is going to make. It's mainly the global shortage of the semicon chips so there are not enough manufacturers, there are not enough companies worldwide. So India has a big opportunity in that space. I think manufacturing is already happening with the mobile phones and multiple other areas. It's a question of giving the Philip, giving the right environment for the industry, for MSMEs as well, giving the right climate, both infrastructure, investment, government support, ease of doing business, and all that contributes to building the sector. Many foreign companies are optimistic about India's growing market and have established facilities for domestic production. We have been supplying goods into India now for, for over 20 years and as the market has grown, uh, we, have dis we decided it was time to invest in India and that is what we did in 2016 by buying this aerosol filling company and we are continuing to invest. The market has grown in the last eight years. India is aiming to grow its electronic sector to $500 billion and create 6 million jobs by the end of the decade. Valued at $150 billion, the sector has progressed significantly, especially in mobile phone manufacturing, including 5G handsets. Transitioning from a major importer, India is now the world's second largest producer and exporter 
with the goal of achieving 100% domestic electronic manufacturing, including chips. Moving on. In the lead up to Sri Lanka's presidential election, the absence of female candidates underscores a troubling gender gap in politics. Women activists in the country emphasize the patriarchal nature of the political landscape where decision making and resources remain largely male dominated. A report. In her close knit, middle class community nestled in the heart of Sri Lanka's capital, grassroots activist Samudra Jalat leads a team of volunteers to distribute campaign leaflets for the upcoming presidential election. But the 61 year old local political leader, a beloved member of the community, is not running for the top job. Instead, she is tapping on her clout to campaign for her presidential candidate of choice, opposition leader Sajit Premadasa. As Sri Lanka grapples with its most severe financial crisis in over 70 years, 17.1 million citizens are set to cast their ballots on September 21st in a crucial presidential election seeking a new leader to steer the nation towards political stability and economic revival over the next five years. In a striking omission, the field of 38 candidates lacks a single female representative, highlighting a concerning gender gap in the country's political landscape. Jalad had once hoped her political career would take off after she won a municipal election in 2012. But she has not held any political post at national level despite working for multiple parties for nearly four decades. Since Sri Lanka introduced the Universal Franchise in 1931, the number of women in Parliament has never crossed a threshold of 7%. Today, they are just 5.3% of its 225 members and historically held only a fraction of cabinet positions. Sri Lankan political party structure, uh, political space uh, is patriarchal dominated and we have not been able to uh, find a way out of uh, that dominance. Women's representation in grassroots governance in Sri Lanka has never crossed 23% despite the spur of a 2016 quota. A similar quota designed to boost their representation at the provincial level beyond the current 5% has been gridlocked in parliament for more than two years. Even the uh, electoral system, if you look at the manner in which you have to spend money, preferential voting system, uh, the struggles to get your nomination, uh, all that, that decision making is in the hands of men, money is in the hands of men, uh, access to resources are controlled by male uh, business elite. This situation highlights the barriers women encounter, including cultural norms, political biases and systematic obstacles that hinder their advancements in leadership roles. As the country navigates its current challenges, the need for diverse voices in leadership becomes even more critical for sustainable development and inclusive governance. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. The people of Tehran express their solidarity with Lebanon after a series of mobile device explosions killed 12 and injured thousands. On September 18, a memorial was held outside the Lebanese embassy in Iran to honor the victims. Simultaneous explosions targeting Hezbollah's communication devices in southern Lebanon, Beirut 
and eastern Lebanon are suspected to be Israeli cyber attacks, raising concerns about the growing threat of electronic warfare in the region. Hezbollah and Israel have been engaged in cross-border warfare since the Gaza conflict erupted last October, fueling fears of a wider Middle East conflict that could drag in the United States and Iran. North Korea fired multiple short-range ballistic missiles on September 18, South Korea and Japan said, days after it unveiled a uranium enrichment facility and vowed to beef up its nuclear arsenal. The missiles lifted off from Kechon, north of the capital Pyongyang, in the northeastern direction, South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said, without specifying how many were fired. 북한이 어제 탄도 미사일과 순항 미사일을 발사하였고 그 탄착 지점은 함경북도 어, 산악 지역으로 평가하고 있습니다. Building on the successful foundation of the Lok Sabha elections 2024, peaceful and enthusiastic voting marked the beginning of assembly elections in Jammu and Kashmir. Voters from all sections of society responded to the call of democracy wholeheartedly. Long queues of voters at the polling stations showcased the entire world, the deep trust and confidence of the people of Jammu and Kashmir in the democratic exercise. A total of 219 candidates were in the electoral fray in the first phase of which nine were women candidates. Young and women voters shone bright at the polling stations, a testament to the deepening and embrace of democracy in Jammu and Kashmir. Disaster drills were conducted in central Taiwan on September 19, involving soldiers, firefighters and emergency responders. The drills come close to the 25th anniversary of the Jiji earthquake, the second deadliest in Taiwan's recorded history, resulting in 2,415 deaths and 11,305 injuries. Mock victims could be seen carried onto ambulances on stretchers and being tended to in emergency tents. Director General of the Chiai County Fire Bureau, Sai Chin N, highlighted the importance of these drills noting the improvements in coordination and equipment since the GG earthquake. 或是在大光美站在中的這個醫療的救助 The drills also featured firefighting efforts at a local plastics factory featuring advanced equipment including a fire extinguisher robot showcasing the integrated preparedness of Taiwan's disaster relief forces In Geneva Baloch activists organized a compelling photo exhibition and demonstration to spotlight human rights violations in Balochistan by Pakistan. They call for international attention to the alarming issues of enforced disappearances and repression. The activists condemned projects like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, arguing that such initiatives exploit the Baloch people and deepen local grievances. The protesters underscored the urgent need for accountability and recognition for Baloch's rights, insisting that the international community must not overlook the plight of the Baloch in their struggle for justice and dignity. The members of the Baloch National Movement organized a powerful photo exhibition and demonstration outside the UN office in Geneva, coinciding with the 57th session of the UN Human Rights Council. The activists aim to draw attention to the ongoing atrocities in Balochistan 
urging the United Nations to take a stand against the pervasive human rights violations in the region, particularly the alarming issues of enforced disappearances. The demonstrators passionately rejected exploitative foreign initiatives such as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, arguing that these projects have only served to occupy us and exploit the indigenous Baloch people. Their message was clear. The international community must not turn a blind eye to the suffering in Balochistan. The protesters in Geneva were joined by human rights defenders from around the globe. Pakistan must be held accountable. The West must cease all military aid to Pakistan because those weapons are being diverted to suppress the people of Balochistan. The Commonwealth must suspend Pakistan. It is violating the Commonwealth Charter and the human rights principles that the Commonwealth espouses. Activists allege that the Pakistani army and intelligence agencies employ torture and abductions as tactics to instill fear and maintain control over the Baloch people who have long been advocating for independence from Pakistan's occupation. They claim that the Baloch have been the targets of military operations, ethnic stereotyping and abductions by the Pakistani state, all while their natural resources continued to be exploited. I think one thing that Pakistan needs to understand, they cannot continue the way things are. Uh, more violence will generate more resistance and the state persecution makes them more resilient. So, the, the Balochistan issue is not complicated, it's very basic. They're asking for some basic things, which includes human rights, basic human dignity, and, and demand that the, the Balochistan rights are recognized and respected. Human rights violations in Balochistan have been a significant concern, particularly in the context of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Many Baloch activists and political leaders argue that CPEC while promising economic development, exacerbates local grievances by prioritizing outside interests over the rights and needs of the local population. The influx of investment and infrastructure development under CPEC have often been met with resistance from local communities who feel marginalized. The local Baloch people claim that the benefits of these projects do not reach them and that their land and resources are being exploited without adequate compensation or consultation. And now let's move to Kathmandu, where the Kumari Puja honors prepubescent girls dressed as the living goddess Kumari in a vibrant annual ritual. Recently, on the occasion, families gathered at the Taleju Bhavani temple to pray for the girls' health and well-being, a tradition deeply rooted in Nepalese culture. This event not only celebrates youth but also preserves the legacy of the Kumari, a living goddess chosen through a rigorous selection process. Take a look. A large number of prepubescent girls adorned in elaborate attire resembling the living goddess Kumari sat in a row according to their assigned numbers to be worshipped, a practice believed to ward off bad luck and disease. This annual event, known as Kumari Puja, takes place in front of the Taleju Bhavani temple in Kathmandu, where Nevari girls perform rituals to honour the goddess who represents divine feminine energy. The living goddess Kumari is considered an otherly incarnation of goddess Durga. एक कुमारी पूजा से ऐसा कि बाहर रो नानी अलग से राम रोज वने रो अरे बहुत सा उनसा नहीं अब बहुत सारे को एकदम दिलगायु को लागे एकदम राम रोज वन न को लागे हो अब एक कुमारी पूजा का रहना बहुत सारे को तेरे राम रो उनसा बहुत सारे को सोचता हूँ उनसा वने रो the kanyas or girls participating in this annual procession are brought to the Taleju Bhavani temple one of Nepal's Shakti Peet which is only open for one day during the shayan. As part of the ritual, these girls are led around the temple dedicated to Taleju Bhavani, a Hindu deity whose face has been concealed from the public for centuries. The worship of the girls in the procession involves three approaches of Hinduism, Buddhism and Tantrism. It is believed that girls who participate in this ritual will be protected from health problems. 
वहाँ और सदैव भरी कुमारी बन बनना नजर गया था अपनी आज एक दिन को लागे अपनी कुमारी होने वहाँ ले पुकारोस बने रह रो वहाँ और पिछड़ो घर रखी थी वहाँ वाले कुने परी रोग बिहारी नोस बने रह जाएं मैं कुमारी पूजा करें कहूँ रो यो कुमारी पूजा घर ना ले जाए डोरो फायदा सा यो कुमारी पूजा घर रखी थी कुन कुन बजरायान पूजा, बजरायान बन्ने गुरुजुले कर सा, और तो ये करना मतलब ही तांत्रिक पूजा बन्ने और कर्मचारी करे करने हो, और हमरो यो बौद्धिक पूजा बन्ने ब्राह्मण ने करने हो, उन्हें पनी यो कुमारी को पूजा करने पड़ता है कि तीन बिजले पूजा होने पड़ता है, और तीन ये चीज तीन बिजले अनुसार को यो कुमारी पूजा तो ये Nepal has a remarkable tradition of worshiping the Kumari, a living goddess selected through a rigorous process. This role is filled by a young Neva girl from Shakya caste, often as young as four years old, who is believed to embody the goddess Taleju, the tutelary deity of the Malla and Shah dynasties. The selection process is strict. Candidates must be free from any physical blemishes and must demonstrate calmness under intense scrutiny even during frightening tests. Once chosen, the Kumari resides in the Kumari Ghar and is prohibited from touching the ground. She only leaves her residence during specific festivals. The Kumari Puja beautifully reflects Nepal's traditions and community devotion for well-being of young girls. And with that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. People have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect.